I might go get my headphones. Oh, good, he's not in yet. Yeah. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome everyone. Um, this is a program by Jerry Davis. He has kindly um, been at our side through thick and thin during the uh, pandemic. Um, this program we are going to see today is called um, India and Cambodia. Just some uh, Zoom etiquette. Please remain muted. Um, and we're going to save our questions till the end, or you can put them in the chat if you would like to. Welcome, everyone. And Jerry, take it away. Very good. Thank you, Jean Marie. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I appreciate all your attendance in this rainy, rainy day. Um, so uh, it sounds like a cliche to speak about a trip of a lifetime. So many travel ads make this claim. However, in our experience, after traveling to all seven continents or over 100 countries, the 28-day cruise and land adventure we experienced on the Region 7 Seas Voyager in 2013, with the pre-trip in Cambodia and the post-trip in India, ranks up there with one of the best. The planning for this trip took over one year to prepare. Owning a travel agency, Alice Travel, whether the largest in New Jersey, certainly gave me a leg up. I also had a great deal of help from the tour, tour operators I used in India and Cambodia. And if any one of you is planning such an extensive trip, I certainly recommend using a travel agency to help with the details and unexpected bumps in the road would always occur. So here is a, uh, obviously a map of Asia. And uh, I think here's my uh, thing. So the 17 day Voyager trip uh, started in Bangkok, Thailand. And really, it, it, we went to a lot of different places, including uh, Malaysia and Singapore, and went around uh, India and wound up in Mumbai. And then we did certain other things in here in, Japa in Jaipur, which I'll explain. Uh, we had always wanted to explore Siem Reap, Cambodia. So Cambodia is here. So you can see it's a very easy flight from Bangkok to uh, well, we didn't fly to Phan uh, Phnom Penh. We actually flew to Siem Reap. Uh, but in any regard, it was an easy flight. Uh, we had always wanted to explore Siem Reap, Cambodia, and the magnificent temples, most especially Angkor Wat. And the timing of this cruise permitted us to do just that prior to the voyage. We flew into Bangkok, spent only a few days sightseeing there as we had traveled there before. And then we flew to Siem Reap, Cambodia the following morning. I just want to give you a very brief history of, of, of the difficulties of the, of the problem of, of, of what happened in, in Cambodia. Cambodia is a, is a country of 15 million people, 95% of, of whom practice Buddhism. The Khmer Empire lasted 600 years and ruled most of East Asia. It became part of the French Empire and had its independence from France in 1953. However, it had a very dark period in history that began in 1970 when there was a coup and the king gave his support to his former enemies, the Khmer Rouge, and Pol Pot was its leader. There became the Cambodian genocide between 1975 and 79. Uh, one and a half to three million people were killed, 25% of the total population. Many were buried in the infamous mass graves and the, quote, killing fields of Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge wanted a socialist agrarian republic, and our guy's parents, who were well-educated, were spared but relocated and sent to a farm. As an aside, the U.S. bombed Cambodia uh, during the war. We used a tour operator, Trails of Indochina, and one of the representatives met us at the airport and uh, whisked us. Uh, so here's a map of, of, of uh, Cambodia. Phnom Penh, the capital, is here and seam peep and, and, and angle water up here. Um, we, uh, he drove us to uh, a Sofitel uh, Fokithra Golf and Spa Resort. Uh, just as another aside, in uh, the United States, people think of so, uh, Sofitels as, uh, you know, uh, maybe two or three star hotels, but in, in Europe and the rest of the world, they're really five star hotels. So here's, a, it was a stunning property with lush gardens and a magnificent swimming pool. Uh, here it is. Unfortunately, the temperatures were in the high 90s every day and the pool water was more like a hot tub than a swimming pool. 
we lucked out and were able to get a large suite, which we were told was the same one that Angelina Jolie shared with her children the week before. So one of my claims to fame is that I slept in the same bed as Angelina Jolie. After a quick lunch, we were off with our private car and driver to visit the picturesque temple of Ta Prom. This one was overgrown with fig trees, which gave it a haunting and exotic atmosphere. Here's our guide. These incredible roots have grown and entwined with the temple's huge stone blocks since the 12th century, resulting in a feeling we were really in a, a forgotten city. Uh, and this was really, I think, um, uh, I'm not sure, maybe only a hundred years ago or less, uh, did people dig down and uh, below the trees and actually find uh, this temple um, complex. So here's another photo of, of one of them. It really is uh, very interesting. We then went to another temple complex called Angkor Thom with its beautiful central towers and outlines of human heads etched deeply into the stone. This site was the capital of the Javanese empire of the 12th century. The site is over 12 kilometers in area consisting of 20 towers with faces. And you can see the faces obviously. And there is still discussion today whether the faces were just everyday people or people transitioned into gods or just faces of the emperor. I've never, I had never seen a complex, a, a complex like that. That night at the hotel, we were treated to a folkloric show put on by local high school children. Uh, and it was done of dancing and singing and instruments as you can see. Um, it was very well done and I was able to get, I was actually at a front table and I was able to get uh, good photos of the, uh, of the dancers as they uh, walked by. This is, what, this is my favorite, I actually thought this girl was quite gorgeous. The following day, we departed early in the morning to beat the crowds in heat to visit the crown jewels of all temples, Angkor Wat. We were not disappointed. The vastness of the 12th century temple complex seemed at first to be overwhelming. It is the largest religious monument in the world, over 402 acres. However, as we examined the site with our expert guide, we grew to appreciate this breast preserved temple with its fascinating decorative flourishes and extensive bass releases. As you can see, we got there very early in the morning and we really did beat the crowds and the heat. Uh, it's monkeys all over the place. You can see uh, well, uh, Irene on the, on the right, obviously the monkey. Uh, this one we saw, we caught uh, actually balloon going up with uh, tourists as well over the site. This is us on the site. Here's our guide and he comes every day when he has um, tourists and he brings water bottles to, uh, to give to the monkeys who uh, take the happily. It is a, a religious um, complex. Irene and I climbed to the top of the climb pick. Climbing up turned to be okay, but climbing down with its very steep staircase proved to be very challenging. Here it is. You, uh, luckily, actually, they did have uh, banisters. I've been to many, many of these places, and I'm sure many of you have, where you take your life in your hands because there are no banisters climbing down. But uh, it was, and we got down safely. Angkor Wat started out as Hindu, then became a, a Buddhist temple. There were Buddhist monks all over it. And actually we could see people getting blessed uh, by uh, uh, religious uh, people who were in the complex. Late that afternoon, we left our hotel for a short drive to Tanle Sap Lake. There we boarded our private Saurus, a traditional wooden boat, and embarked on an adventure to discover the floating villages on the lake. The images of, light, of life along the lake were fascinating. Uh, the lake was very shallow and a few times the captain's helper had to get into the muddy water and literally pull the boat into deeper water. 
So uh, this is the captain. He looked about nine years old, but we had no choice. He was it if we wanted to get on the boat. Uh, and as I say, along uh, the road, there were, this was obviously a fisherman, people collecting, uh, I don't know if that, I don't think it's a rice field, uh, other food, rice bliss, people coming up in their own boats selling wares. This uh, was a boat with the boats, people swimming in here. I'm not quite sure I would want to swim in this water, but obviously a lot of people were. Fishing seemed to be the main draw. Here you can see the uh, assistant captain uh, pulling us off a sandbar while the captain was backing up the boat. It was motorized, but uh, I say it was very, very shallow. Here we're approaching the, uh, some of the floating, uh, floating uh, villages where they sell everything, you know, and people bring their wares there. Welcome to Tonle Sap Lake. Another woman selling her wares. This was interesting, scared the crap out of Irene. Uh, so here's uh, this guy uh, with, uh, two, uh, with his friend uh, with uh, snakes around his, his, and his idea about making one who was going up to um, tourists asking if they wanted to uh, uh, had their picture taken with the snake. Uh, regardless, you gave him money. If you wanted it, you gave it. If you didn't want it, you gave it to him because otherwise you had no idea what he was going to do. This poor girl um, is in a bathtub, as you can see, and what she was doing uh, not very successfully was getting uh, cans and bottles from the water or what she was then going to resell. And we were, uh, we did have a, a, a stunning sunset that day. Uh, this is a tuk-tuk. Uh, these are uh, all over Southeast Asia. This is the pre predominant mode of transportation. Uh, you can go anywhere as a guy goes for a buck, maybe two, uh, but that's all it is. And you can go a half an hour away and, and he'll take you and your group with you. And they're all over Southeast Asia, as I say. The following morning, we drove about a an hour and a half from Sea Reap towards the Cambodian countryside to a temple complex called Beng Milia, a sprawling temple constructed in a distinctly Angkor Wat style of the 12th century. Today, the, uh, the temple is largely overgrown by vegetation and the stone walls are crumbling, but it does add it to a charm in a unique way. Uh, here it is, you can see again, it was discovered and uh, with, um, Thick trees uh, overwhelming it, uh, things all around. Again, this was a war zone, keep in mind, in the 70s. And this, the German government, uh, where there were mines all over the Cambodia, and uh, they uh, were cleared in this general area by uh, people from the German government, or remember, from the, not the government, is probably people who uh, came over uh, from AIDS, from, uh, from Germany. Uh, we then headed to uh, Bantre Sre. We had heard about this complex from friends in the travel business and we were told not to miss it. The advice was right on. It was very far away, as I say, it was probably two and a half hours. Uh, but the Redstone Temple is, is very unique. One of the Cambodia's most uh, significant structures whose walls are decorated with elaborate carvings, very, very well preserved. Um, it was, uh, as I say, very uh, remarkably uh, well, well done. I mean, think about this from the 12th century, whatever it is, the carvings and how uh, beautiful they are, uh, really fast reliefs in the walls. It was very, very hot. This was really one of the only days Irene really felt the heat and we really cut it short and had to get out of the sun. It must have been 105 and with, with high, high humidity. Uh, it was quite hot when we left there. We went for a, a, a simple but delicious lunch in a traditional wooden house. So here's a woman uh, waiting, uh, greeting us and there's a dining room to the left 
I'm not quite sure what the bed was there for, but I didn't ask. The uh, following morning, we flew back to Bangkok and we met with a representative driver from Trails of Indochina. And off we went on an hour and a half drive to the port of Bangkok uh, to board the uh, Region 7 Cheese Voyager for the next part of our Southeast Asian adventure. Uh, Region 7 Seas is a luxury uh, deluxe uh, um, cruise line, or oh, there's about 350 suites, 700 passengers, all double occupancy or, or triple if you wanted it, um, all uh, with uh, verandas. Uh, actually, I have friends, I think, who are actually on this call who were actually on this ship or, or sister ship to it, and unfortunately got caught at the beginning of COVID and had to come home. But I know some of them are also going on one in January uh, to the Caribbean. It really is a fabulous, fabulous ship. Uh, all, of, uh, all food and drink, uh, alcoholic beverages are included. All the shore excursions are included, which is very unusual. And uh, it was really, it's a fabulous, uh, fabulous cruise line. The cruise we were on was for 17 days from Bangkok, Thailand to Mumbai, India. It made stops in Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and India. There were far too many exciting ports of call to describe in this short presentation. And I will just describe those in India. So here's a map of India. And we started, actually, you can't see Bangkok on here. This is uh, Rangoon, uh, Burma. Uh, but uh, it went down here and uh, crossed uh, uh, the uh, Bay of Bengal. And uh, when, as I say, I went to Singapore and Malaysia, whatever it is, and started. And the first uh, uh, port uh, of, of of, in India was uh, Kochi, which is now called Cochin. And then it went up to Goa and Bangalore, which is Bangalore, and wound up in Bombay. Uh, we got off in Bombay, actually, into the cruise, but we flew up uh, to uh, ports here. You can see Agra and you can see Delhi, also Jaipur. Uh, we, we flew up to, uh, to there after we left Mumbai. So here is the um, here is the uh, the, the sail into um, into um, um, uh, Cochin. So while India is the seventh largest country in the world in area, it is the second in population, 1.2 billion people. It's the most populous democracy. The major religion is Hinduism, and so here we are in. Um, in going, coming into uh, uh, Cochin. Uh, we, there are obviously so many other sites in India which we just didn't have time to do it. So here we are coming into Cochin and you can see the large fishing nets, which we will see later in India. I decided to use the service of another great tour operator called Zushi because there is so much to see in uh, Cochin, the ship overnighted here. When we disembarked, we were met by one of Zushi's fabulous guides, and off we went to explore it. The highlight of the afternoon was walking the promenade on the sea and seeing the old Chinese fishing nets and the fish market. Many locals who were walking the promenade seemed very curious about us. I don't think very many uh, Americans or, uh, really do come to this part of India. It was really another great, remarkable area with great photo opportunities. So here was a demonstration of what they were doing with the fishing nets and the large fishing nets. Um, here's a better, better picture of it. Don't ask me how it works. I don't know, it's down with rocks and then they lift it up and it must be some sort of a teeter system. Uh, and then they drop the teeters and the belt, the, the, the uh, Net goes in the water and then they pull it out with these things again, and that's the way it works. It was very interesting. The following morning, we were again met with our Zushi guide to explore Cochin. Uh, and of course, with the lays and everything else, with the spices and everything, and uh, uh, it, it was very well done. So at one time, Cochin had a very large Jewish population. There is still a working synagogue, which was closed the day we were there, but we could explore the perimeter. There were many shops on Jew Street, which 
you know, it sounds strange. Uh, they can never use that term actually in the United States, but here it was used and uh, without any feelings, Jewish stars over it. Here's Jew Street and on the way to the uh, synagogue. So here's the synagogue, unfortunately it was closed, uh, but obviously the signs, I was told it was still a working uh, a signal, but I, I think there were, they said there were five or maybe five or 10 families there. This was obviously uh, something that uh, poster for blowing the chauffeur on um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And there was a church there as well, a Dutch church and a Catholic uh, cemetery. And there was a plaque here signifying the tomb of Vasco da Gama. But as you can see, there's not very much there, but we've seen these plaques signifying his burying places and other places as well. So uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt that uh, Vasco da Gama is obviously not there. Uh, this was really one of the most interesting things we saw. Um, it, it's actually, these are huge statues or, or other things that they sell for homes that uh, have to be really large because these things are absolutely huge, but it was a store just for these. And it was, uh, there's an elephant here. You gotta have a, a house uh, like a palace to get it. But what was also magnificent about it was it was right on the river and it was really a, a beautiful thing. I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh, we then visited the Caracalla Katkali Center for Martial Arts exhibition followed by a Kabuki-like show. So here we saw a martial arts exhibition, which was well done. And then we saw uh, this um, a kabuki like show, and all the participants were men, uh, similar to what is in Japan, but some were, but there were some of them who were dressed up as women. And we saw one putting on makeup before the show. Uh, it was it was very well done with uh, with uh, you can see here she is with her uh, he he is with uh, his full makeup. Uh, and there's a bad guy there with the sword and he was going to kill her. He wanted to marry her and she wanted to, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, anyway, it was, it was, it was well done and uh, instruments and everything else. Uh, I'm glad to say that she made it out alive without any sword marks. Our next destination in Cochin turned out to be very special. With our guide, we visited the Don Bosco Nana Bahavin. This is a school follow, founded by a Catholic priest who rescued 75 orphan boys found on the street. He schooled and gentled them until they turned 17. Uh, and they did a song and dance thing for us. Uh, it was really quite moving uh, to see these kids uh, who came up to us, wanted to shake our hands and actually just touch us. It was, it was quite moving. This was the priest who was here who introduced us. And we had uh, the travel consortium, our agency belonged to, Ensemble Travel Group made a donation to the school, which Irene and I presented to the priest. And it was quite an emotional experience for us. And here is their dormitory. And they had dining rooms and schoolhouse. So I didn't, you know, I can't show you all the photos but whenever it is. The following morning, the 17th voyage sailed to Mangalore and we drove to Karkala to visit the Montlith stone statue of Lord Gomachera. We were blessed by a Hindu priest and visited a farm nearby. We never turned down being blessed. We were blessed in Jerusalem by a Catholic police in, in the church of the nativity or not the church, the church of the other one. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, we, we, never, we never turned it down. Uh, the following morning, uh, we uh, said our next stop was Goa, uh, and the most interesting part of the stay here, uh, I'm sorry, this is still in, uh, I apologize, Mangalore, and we visited a farm nearby. These kids looked a little young to be working in the fields, but I didn't ask. Everybody loves to have their picture taken, and there is no exception. Our next stop was Goa. The most interesting part of this day was seeing the fruit market. While the rest of the group went from the ship went jewelry shopping, we decided to walk on our own in search of the fruit and vegetable market, which really was quite interesting. 
we spent some time there and actually had some difficulty um, finding our way back to the bus, which would take us back to the ship. Uh, we made it just in time uh, to avoid having to figure out a way to get back to the ship on our own. Uh, lesson to be learned here, you don't want to miss the ship because uh, they'll leave without you. Uh, they won't leave without you if you actually uh, were on a, a tour sponsored by the cruise line, which we were on, but if we couldn't get back to the bus and the bus left us, uh, we would have been there and having to figure out a way to get to the next stop. So our, our last port on the cruise was Mumbai. Uh, we knew we had to disembark the ship early in the morning, but we did not want to waste the day just packing. So we decided to do an excursion with Region to the Elephantic Caves, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. We did this part of the ship and drove to the arch called the Gateway to India. And the bus left us off there to explore before we were to board a small boat to take us to the caves. Across the street, we noticed the Taj Hotel, luxury, luxury hotel, Taj, uh, still covered with bunting over several floors. You can see the bunting right here. And this was a tragedy, a terrible tragedy that occurred in 2008 because the Taj Hotel was attacked by terrorists. They murdered many guests in the hotel and attacked other locations in Mumbai, including a Jewish religious school. It is little wonder that the security is so tight all over India. Uh, it was like a, a novel. They came across by zodiacs from the water, came over in different zodiacs, and they had different plans. Some went to the hotel, some went to the Jewish school, other just uh, uh, the, in, in, in and just going into stores and shooting whoever they could. It was uh, it was an awful thing. Actually, uh, one of the tour operators we used actually lost a. a a guest there, he was having dinner in the dining room and was killed. So here's the, the little boat that we joined. We weren't by ourselves, but it was an hour and a half sailing to the island where the caves are located. Uh, and it was beautiful and it was lovely. And again, monkeys again, monkeys all over. Don't please, don't tease the monkeys. Don't please the monkey, they'll attack you. And they're all over the place. So it was quite a hike to get up to the uh, caves. It was over 120 steep steps. There were stall, small shops, really stalls lining the way with monkeys all around us. Chair carriers took non-walkers up the steps. This guy was part of our group and you could see he was very comfortable uh, going up the steps. Uh, the rock cut caves date from the fifth to the eighth centuries and are filled with stone sculptures. The caves and the sculptures are dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva. Uh, we had never seen anything like this before. Very well done. Our excellent guide spent a great deal of time exploring the history and the traditions. A uh, quick story on this. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing a pink shirt. And there are a lot of other Americans in here, but the kids, guys, other people, wanted to have my, the picture taken with me, not with Irene, with me. And I have a feeling the only reason was because they had never seen a guy wear a pink shirt before. I don't know if it's true, but anyway, it's a good story. As you can see here, uh, cows are sacred in India and these are the stalls and they roam wherever they want. So the following day we disembarked the ship very early in the morning. We met a Zushi representative who drove us to the Mumbai domestic airport for our one and a half hour flight to Jaipur. At the Jaipur airport, we met by another Zushi representative and drivers who whisked us to our hotel, the Ramba Palace. And the, what a palace it was. The best hotels in India are some of the most beautiful in the world. Um, truly, we were greeted by at least six people. Uh, one threw rose petals, another held a large umbrella over Irene, as you can see, to protect her from the sun on her 10 step journey to the lobby. God forbid she should walk in the sun for 10 steps. But regardless, you can see the um, security uh, um, tower there uh, because uh, it still was very, very, um, the security is very, very tight in India. Uh, this was uh, the concierge. You don't check in at the guest, you check in at your in your room. 
And you can see the courtyard here, which was beautiful. So this was one of their employees. And you can see he's carrying what looks like a flag. And his job, uh, I'm not going to open it up for, to figure out what it is. He's not waving a white flag for peace or to give up. His job was to clear away pigeons so that they don't land in the courtyard and mess everything up on the benches. So here's the a quick lunch. Our guide met us in the lobby. We were off sightseeing in Jaipur. Uh, I did not take this photo. This is a stock photo, but it gives you an idea of what the traffic is. It is very difficult to describe the chaos of driving in India, and Jaipur was no exception. The story goes that you need three good things to drive in India, a good horn, good brakes, and good luck. The cars share the road with cows who are sacred in India and roam everywhere, camels, donkeys, tuk-tuks, wagons, scooters, bicycles, pedestrians, vendors, and other assorted animals and humans. There is no line separating lanes in the road, and nobody would follow them anyway. While we saw a few action and accidents, we were amazed we did not see many more. Uh, and the most important instrument on a car or anything in India is the horn. It constantly, constant, constant, all you hear are horns. Uh, Jaipur is called the pink city, as much of the city center is filled with palaces and forts that are made of pink sandstone. We passed the Hawa Mahat, the most recognizable monument in Jaipur, with five stories and 150 windows with hanging lattice balconies. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a good photo because you can see the building was covered with bamboo lattice work as it was being renovated and, and reinforced. Uh, here's another building um, being renovated and you can see these guys standing there without any safety harnesses around them. Uh, safety measures seem to be at a minimum in India. Our next stop was at an outdoor astronomical, uh, astronomical ob observatory, excuse me, with many instruments still being used today, even though it was built in 1728. Uh, so many of the children wanted their picture taken with us, which we of course obliged. Some of them just wanted to have their pictures taken by themselves. They wanted to look like movie stars. Uh, here's our guide and we saw the city palace. Uh, which was really magnificent. So here's another story. As we were walking in a square, a snake charmer approached us, pulled out a canvas bag, then a basket and a flute, and plopped down. A huge cobra came out of the basket under the influence, hopefully, of the charmer. Irene was horrified and pulled back quickly. I stood by realizing that the man expected money for the show he was providing. And I certainly was not going to walk away without giving him something, because quite frankly, I was afraid what might happen if I didn't tip him. Uh, but we did get away safely. But really, it was a true walk in, minding our own business in the street. And this guy approaches us with this basket and just plops it down and starts his act. The street markets were colorful and very, very lively. There were colorful clothing, magnificent flowers, housewares, and everything you can imagine was on sale. Uh, spice is also very important in India. Uh, the most interesting stalls were the ones for the brides and their mothers who were shopping for wedding dresses. This is one of them. Uh, we found this very, very interesting. We stood by here for a while, uh, seeing the uh, shopkeepers bring out uh, their wares for the brides and their mothers. The following morning, we met our guide, Dev, and off we went to see one of the highlights of Jaipur, the Amber Fort, red sandstone built in 1550. We were supposed to ride up to the fort on an elephant, but we were told it was a holiday and the elephants were on vacation. Uh, I believe that story, and we actually had to be like other people and actually walk up to the entrance. How dare they? This uh, had a lot of uh, people there. This woman was cleaning the streets, other parts of the temple complex. Uh, they sure know what they're doing. You go inside there and the guy tells you to stand in a certain place. So your, your picture there is, is shown on the mirror right near the wall. 
palaces and hotels in India, you go to the right ones are just magnificent. So they have floating palaces too that you can only get there by boat. So here we, um, we, we stopped at a, uh, I'm embarrassed about these photos because we stopped along the, so they had a celebration or something going on. And I, we must have been by ourselves and the uh, guide wasn't with us to explain what was going on. Uh, but we were taking photos and you can see things in the river. We really didn't know whether it was a celebration, uh, a wedding uh, or anniversary or a funeral, quite frankly. Uh, and I still don't know if somebody really knows at the end of this, I would really appreciate filling us in on what it was. There is a car there, obviously, with uh, wrapped in something. I'm assuming it was a funeral, but I, I really don't know. From Jaipur, we uh, set out on a five hour journey by car to Agra, the home of the Taj Mahal. While the ride was a long one, there were many interesting sights along the way. This was the uh, guy at the hotel. Thought this baby was very interesting looking. Took this from the car we were in. So let me tell you, we were on almost a, a highway. It doesn't look like a highway here, but you share the roads with everybody. Here's a little wagon with a camel. And he was on the road the same way as trucks and cars and everybody else. I don't know how this guy can ride his bike with all the things he's behind him, but he did. On the way, we stopped at another uh, palace called Fatapur Sikri. This is the imperial city of the Mughal uh, dynasty from 19, 1571 to 1584. And it was really, really magnificent. This was our guide who was with us. It is deserted now, uh, but it was really one of the more interesting things uh, we, um, we saw. Uh, late that afternoon, we arrived in Agra, the home of the Taj Mahal, and checked into our hotel, the Obervoy Amara Villas, another palace. Um, so here's the front of the hotel where you, ch where you walk in, but really it's the back of the hotel because every room on the other side uh, faced the Taj Mahal. So obviously that was the most desirable places to be. These, I think, were all public rooms on this side. Uh, the pool area, which unfortunately we didn't have time to use, was the most beautiful I have ever seen. And as you can see, it really is absolutely magnificent. So this is, uh, I don't think this is from our room. Uh, this was from as we walk into our room, but you could see that this is a Taj Mahal, but it was the back of the Taj Mahal. Um, the front of the Taj Mahal, you'll see in a few seconds. Uh, we wanted to arrive at the Taj Mahal at dawn the following morning. Uh, you can't drive to the Taj in a car as the city wants to keep pollution to an absolute minimum. So alternative mode of transportation that be a golf cart. So this is what it is early in the morning, uh, we got here and we lucked out. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we got there very early. Uh, we didn't get there for dawn, but it was cloudy over anyway. And I, we wouldn't have gotten a good picture of, uh, of the Taj Mahal at dawn anyway. It, it would have been not a good one. So here it is. Um, the Taj Mahal is sheer poetry and marble. It is actually a mausoleum, the monumental labor of love of a great ruler for his beloved queen took 22 years and 20,000 people to build. We were fortunate to arrive early in the morning and the crowds were not bad. And we had several hours of leisurely walking, resting, looking, sitting, and contemplating the awesome wonder of the war of the world. This is a bench that they do. Everybody from the President of the United States to the King of Siam to us sits at that bench with their leg up, whatever it is. A guy takes a picture and sends it to you because you have to have this photo in front of the Taj Mahal on the bench. We took it from all angles. And you can see the intricate carvings um, uh, really were quite, quite intricate. And that's obviously why it took 22 years to build. 
Uh, you can go in the front entrance, uh, but you can't go into where the mausoleum area, where the, I don't even know if it's still there, the uh, crypt uh, where the queen uh, was buried. Um, this was one of my, our favorite spots that day was behind the, the Taj Mahal because nobody really visited it. Uh, everyone would be in the front, but it was the most peaceful part of the, uh, of the uh, hotel, of the uh, Taj Mahal. And again, you go out and there were cows roaming the roads wherever they want, that's where they were. Donkeys. We, as I say, we returned to the hotel for breakfast and then packed up the car for the drive to our last stop in India, which was Delhi. Uh, we stopped at a um, place, a uh, factory where all sorts of tables and other iners were made using semi-precious inlaid stone and marble. We saw our artist at work and did buy a table for our house, which I think we slept on the plane. I'm not sure whether or they sent it. I don't even know. Um, it was quite beautiful. Uh, and on the way, we did visit the fabulous Agra Fort, uh, which was very crowded. But this was actually the fort where the Shah, uh, uh, the one who was uh, in the palace, I'm sorry, who built the Taj Mahal, wound up being arrested by his son, a uh, nice guy, and uh, kept his father uh, imprisoned in this uh, uh, palace. I think he was finally freed, the Agra Fort. It was quite beautiful inside. Again, it was a complex, just wasn't one to port. And this was the terrace where uh, the Shah himself was able to go out and look and see the Taj Mahal and see the tomb where his um, wife was buried, but unfortunately was never able to see it, never able to visit it. So in Delhi, we decided to stay at a hotel only 15 minutes from the airport. And this is the Oberoi and uh, Gargaon, excuse my pronunciation. Um, so they call this an airport hotel because it was only 15 minutes and usually the flights uh, over to the United States or to Europe are usually at night. Uh, so you want to stay because of the traffic, you want to stay near the airport. And it really was a beautiful hotel. Uh, and uh, so this uh, is another employee whose job I'm sure you will not be able to figure out. So I'll tell you, no, he's not the tennis pro. His job is to catch flies and kill them and keep them off the, uh, off the guests. With that thing that looks like a tennis racket, but actually it catches flies. So after breakfast, we met our guide for a whirlwind day of sightseeing in Old and New Delhi. Uh, this was the guide and we uh, went to a, a, a someplace called Qatar Minar, one of the finest uh, towers in India. Uh, uh, we actually did see on the way a funeral, did see the one carrying it to being cremated, of course. Uh, there was another, um, this is called Jaman Nasjid, one of the largest mosques in India. Uh, they uh, obviously, I did not wear that when I started out, but they wanted to uh, put that on the men and the women uh, because of uh, it, is a, um, it is a mosque and they wanted you to be, um, not show your legs. Uh, this was uh, really, uh, the, uh, this was Rahat, the last resting place of the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, of course, was cremated here. And this one had a lot of tourists. They had a lot of tourists all over, but a lot, most, a lot of Indians uh, residents as well to visit. Uh, it's like going to uh, Mount Vernon. We went in a uh, rickshaw ride, uh, which, uh, which was fun, into the old part of Delhi. Um, I thought these were fascinating. Everybody you go in India, you see, you know, everybody trying to make out and steal electricity. So you 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 move it from one building to another. You then you finally get a wire, move it to your own building, and there you go. You had electricity for free. We bought, so I said we bought it that cycle in the crowded market. We were in the market, and tiny streets and shops and stalls on both sides. And there's the uh, India Gate, which really turned out to be interesting. Other palaces. 
So our last full night in Delhi, we had a real treat in store for us. The owners of Zushi, who I know very well, the tour operator took such wonderful care of us, invited us for dinner at his home. And it was very, very special. Um, first of all, it really wasn't a house. And, and for if there are any people um, from India on this uh, presentation, I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to, to talk about the riches of this family. Uh, but first of all, it wasn't a house, but a two and a half acre farm, uh, which of course you, you don't see anything. You go to the gate and it's, you can't see it. You have a gate, there's a guard house. The guard checks your credentials and then opens the gate. And then you start to see everything what you see. Two and a half acre farm with magnificent gardens, a swimming pool, a tennis court. There were 12 servants with five livings. Uh, both Zushi families were there. They were so hospitable. We felt that we were really part of the family. They gave us a book, they gave us some gifts and explained to us uh, about, about the riches. And, and uh, again, I, I, the riches in India are, are, are so, you can so see the differential between the rich and the poor. And uh, it, it was quite something. We actually mentioned it uh, to uh, the wife of, of one of the sushis. And she mentioned that even though there is a, a caste system and you don't talk about it anymore, uh, some of them really do believe in incarnation and they hope that they'll be coming back as, as a reincarnation as somebody who would be more wealthy than what they are. But anyway, it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. It really was a trip of a lifetime. We were away for 28 days. It was one of our longest trips, but really uh, we enjoyed it tremendously. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you for your attention. We had a meal, we had wonderful uh, dinner and everything they served there as well. So thank you very much. Uh, yep. If there, I, I think, uh, uh, we have some time if uh, I know Jean Marie is going to open it up for questions. If you have any questions, don't make them hard now. I do have uh, one question from Mohan and he or she would like to know, may I know the cruise name and boarding point of this journey? Yes. The cruise name is Regent Seven Seas and the journey, this one uh, uh, began in Bangkok, Thailand and wound up for, for 17 or 19 days. Uh, and it went uh, through um, Singapore, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, uh, other ports in Cambodia actually too. Uh, and then went to India, as I said, it started in, we, we were there in, uh, uh, wound up in Goa, Mangalore, up to Mumbai, we got off of Mumbai. And then we did the, what they call the Golden Triangle uh, of Jaipur and uh, Delhi and, um, and Agra, uh, and then uh, flew home from there. Got it. Thank um, you. Jerry, would you like to um, stop screen share so that if anyone would like to sure. um, ask any questions? So um, feel free to unmute yourself if you would like, or you can write it in the chat if you feel shy. Um, you can, you don't necessarily have to ask a question. You can certainly comment on the beautiful pictures that Jerry Davis has shared with us today. And Jerry, I have a question. Um, sure. You said from Bangkok, right? So from here, from U.S. to Bangkok, um, it's, it's all in one package that as part of the journey, whatever. Uh, well, actually, actually, um, you might have flew through. I did my own air, but, but actually when you do a region seven seas cruise mm -hmm. now, uh, if you go overseas to Europe or whatever it is, they do include business class air. Now, when I say include, you pay for it and I trust me, it's not cheap, but it is included, or you can take what they call a credit, an air credit, and you can do your own air. I, I'm trying to remember, I think we flew nonstop. I think we flew nonstop from JFK wow. probably to Bangkok. Wow. Uh, that's good. Okay. Thank you. And I also see that you have your own travel, Alice Travel. I, I, Alice Travel, I did have Alice Travel. I did sell Alice Travel uh, to somebody who worked for me in 19, 
2014. I, uh, I worked there for three more years. But again, if you would like uh, some help or whatever it is, I can certainly put you in touch with, sure. uh, with anybody there. And I highly recommend the agency. Yeah, the reason why I was asking about is because I was thinking of to for Alaska. Uh -huh. um, so I need some guidance and um, sure, you know, sure. that's why. Why don't you, you can call me uh, and I'll put you in touch. Uh, I, we've been to Alaska several times, both on a cruise and on land. It's a wonderful, wonderful trip. It's one of the areas that are open now actually uh, to travel uh, in the United States and around the world, although it's opening up quickly otherwise, but, but Alaska is wonderful. It's wonderful with children and grandchildren. And it's also wonderful by uh, just a, a, your couple, a couple. Okay, I will keep in touch and over the Very phone. Good. If look you can share your it. information, that'd yes, be great. Look forward yeah. to it, I'll be glad to. Thank um, you. Jerry, do you want me to put your phone number in the um, in the chat box so everyone sure, can you see can it? Put my, you can put my cell phone okay, number Okay, go ahead. I don't- You want, I don't, you want me to give it to you? Is that what you said? Yes, please. 201-787. 5515. Five, and that's so, so you all can call him and harass him and yeah, ask no, for no, advice. Don't no, I, I know where you live. Don't harass that's me. Right. I know how to, I know how to get right. back to you. Um, anybody else? Anything Any else? Any other comments or? Um, Good job, Jerry. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you. I see my daughter Elizabeth is on the, is on there. That's very nice to know. Uh, my wife too. That's terrific. <laughs> I don't know who else he is, but uh, on this hour, anyway. And Shlomo, thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Good job, Jerry. Oh, thank, thank you, you Jerry. Carla. Thank you. I, I again, I, I, I have to be careful because when I open this up to my camera club with the salon members and everything, I have to be very careful to tell them this is a travelogue. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jerry, but you did have one shot that was a little broken. Uh, <laughs> only one? Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I really appreciate everybody uh, who was on the call. Any, any, anything else? Jerry. Yes. Thanks a lot for the tour. Yes, Barry. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you. And, nice to see you. Uh, I, I enjoyed your presentation last week. Actually. <laughs> the, uh, thank you. The thank you. Thank you. You were terrific. Jerry. Yes. Yes, Lou. I don't see your daughter here on the screen. Uh, she, uh, Elizabeth Crin. Where, what is she doing? Elizabeth, is it really you? Or, did you, uh, or is it your children? <laughs> it is. We're here. We're here. On video. We're here. We're, video. We're gonna turn on the video. On, put yourself on video. I can't see you. There you go. Now there it is. Whole, it's I, I, Elizabeth I, and her husband. Uh, you're, and you're Mike and you Matt. Know, all doesn't want to and be on stop camera. eating and enjoy the video. For God. Yeah. So and we all enjoyed it. It was our Thank dinner. You. It was our dinner entertainment. I'm glad you. Enjoyed. Wonderful. Where's Wonderful. Sophie? That's the only one I'm missing. There. It's New Haven. Oh, she's in New Haven, right? She started her job at Yale. Okay. Um, anything else? Thank you. Hi. I, I I shouldn't have to say hello, everybody, but I appreciate it. Marty, thank you so much. I want to thank you. My, my, my brother-in-law, Donald. Uh, I don't know who Robert is, uh, but I saw other people as well. Um, uh, Karen and Tom, thank you. Watch that dog. Watch your food. Um, make sure it doesn't get on the table. And Joy and Leon, you guys look terrific. Thank you. Uh, Lou and Clara, I think that's Clara. I hope it's Clara. Yes. One other quick question, if nobody yes. else has got a question. Okay. Sure. How do you plan it? I mean, in terms of the financial wise and the better time, you know, in terms of the um, the travel aspects wise, the right time to travel, because sometime it might be very expensive um, during certain time period of it, um, but sometime it will be okay to travel, uh, less expensive as well. So how do you prep it up yourself, basically? Well, you, you obviously know you're gonna only go to Alaska in the summer season. There's only Correct. one season to Alaska, which Correct. is a high season, but there are others, but you have to be very careful. For example, you don't wanna to travel to India uh, in, in, in May, June and July, because it'll be 125 degrees. Right. So most people, you know, you, you're going to, you're going to travel there in, in the, in the winter, our, our winter, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that you're not there in their summer. 
So uh, and there there will be. You're, you're yeah. right. You will spend. You will you will uh, pay less money to travel off season. That just mm -hmm. the way if you go to the Caribbean. No, there's a lot of people. If you go to the Caribbean in, in May, in June, you're going to pay less money. Alan, Alan, stop feeding your face, Christ, and, and listen to the people. It's using chopsticks. chopsticks. I'm very impressed. Uh, Stuart, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, I think that's enough. Yeah. This, okay. I'm just wondering, does any other... Um, Anyone have any other questions or comments? Um, if not, then um, I guess we will bid you all good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Thanks for all your work. information. Thank right. you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. You too, right, uh, um, uh, Jean Marie? Uh, right. Say it again. I'm going to leave as well. Yeah, you can leave as well, too. Very good. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to close the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully, we'll be soon um, in person. Yes. All right. Thank that was you, wonderful, Jerry. Jerry. Thank you very much. Hi, I appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. All, right. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.